Hi, I'm Bruce Campbell. Welcome to the PNOC informational webinar for appendinomas. Today, our panelists will give an overview of appendinomas, the current treatment landscape, and clinical trial development. And I'm Alan Campbell, and together we help co-found PNOC Foundation 10 years ago in 2010, excuse me, 2013, three years after our son was diagnosed with an anaplastic appendomoma. At that time, resources like today's webinar and access to these expert panelists from different institutions and in a group setting didn't exist. We're grateful to have it and to share it with all of you today. At Peanut Foundation, our mission is to urgently raise funds, resources, and awareness to support Peanut's research and clinical trials and to ultimately improve the outcomes for all children with brain tumors. For those of you joining us for the first time, PNOC is a leading global pediatric brain cancer consortium with over 40 study sites across the US, Europe, Australia, Israel, and India, striving to improve outcomes through a unique collaborative approach, translating the latest findings in brain tumor biology into innovative, novel clinical trials and more effective treatments, all whilst maintaining a real sense of speed and urgency. Mm. We have a wide range of, of viewers today for those that are children that are newly diagnosed to some of those who've been fighting this disease for a long time. And we want to answer as many questions in, as possible and encourage you to post those questions in the Q&A for our panelists. Please use your Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And bear in mind that the panelists aren't here to actually give um, specific consults on individual patients, but will answer general questions to the best of their ability. And there's always the opportunity to consult with our panelists uh, directly in another setting. It's an honor to introduce our distinguished panel, Dr. Michael Prados, PNOC Scientific Co-Founder, Charles B. Wilson Endowed Chair in Neurological Surgery, Professor Emeritus, Department of Neurological Surgery and Department of Pediatrics at UCSF, Dr. Prados has over 35 years of experience at UCSF in treating both adults and children who have brain tumors. Dr. Cassie Klein, Director of Clinical Research for Neuro-Oncology within the Division of Oncology at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, as well as Assistant Professor of Pediatrics at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. She serves as Project Co-Lead for PNOC. Dr. Robert Weschler-Rea, Professor of Neurological Sciences, Columbia University, Department of Neurology, Scientific Director of Brain Tumor Research, the Herbert Irving Comprehensive Cancer Center. We also have Dr. Eugene Wang, Jean Wang, Chief Division of Oncology at Children's National Medical Center, Director of Clinical Neuro-Oncology Immunotherapy Program. Dr. Derek Hansen, Section Chief of Pediatric Neuro-Oncology, Joseph M. Samsari, Children's Hospital at Hackensack University Medical Center. Dr. Steve Bronstein, Associate Professor and Vice Chair, Department of Radiation Oncology, UCSF. Dr. Bronstein is a radiation oncologist who cares for both adult and pediatric patients specializing in treating brain and spinal tumors. And finally, Dr. Sabine Mueller, PNOC uh, Scientific Co-Founder, Professor of Neurology, Neurosurgery and Pediatrics at UCSF, and Affiliated Professor at the University of Zurich, Switzerland. Dr. Mueller actually has been a called uh, a way to attend to an urgent uh, clinical matter, such is the nature of uh, pediatric oncology, but she hopes to join us uh, later in the discussion. She's there. Oh, there. great. Welcome, <laughs> Dr. Mueller. Yeah, thank you, Bruce. Now it's time to turn it over to our panelists for an overview of appendomoma for newly diagnosed patients. Great, thanks. I'll share my screen. Okay, can you guys see the screen? Yep. Great. Uh, Derek, if you wanted to go ahead. Sure. Uh, yeah. So uh, Dean and I just wanted to take a few moments just to give a brief uh, overview of appendomoma, um, just for any families who are, are uh, dealing with children who are more newly diagnosed and just give a, like I said, a general sense of, of where things stand with the tumor um, currently in terms of treatment and management of these tumors. Bring up the next slide, Gene. Thanks. So overall, uh, ependymoma is the third most common central nervous system tumor that we see in children. It's about eight to 10% of all diagnoses. So this is something that we're seeing on a, on a fairly regular basis as pediatric neuro-oncologists. 
um, and really presents a, a challenge. Um, even though it's common, um, the, the management of these tumors uh, can be extremely complicated and difficult. Um, and really, um, each case deserves you know, very careful consideration uh, as the best way to approach the tumor for each child. Um, these tumors uh, arise from ependymal cells, which are the cells that line the ventricles or the fluid spaces in the brain. Um, so these can occur in a number of different locations. Uh, in children, most commonly, we see these in the posterior fossa, um, which is the, the lower back part of the brain, uh, but they can also occur um, in, the, in the top part of the brain called the supertentorium um, with the lateral ventricles. And uh, rarely, these can also occur in the spinal cord. Uh, main treatment for ependymomas uh, breaks down to surgical resection and radiotherapy, um, although sometimes chemotherapy is used in the treatment of these tumors. Um, there's a little bit of uh, debate uh, regarding the use of chemotherapy in these tumors, which we'll touch on in a few moments, uh, but definitely the, the main stays of treatment are surgery and radiation. Um, overall, uh, these are difficult tumors to treat. There are some ependymomas that have a very good prognosis. Um, and can be cured uh, in some cases with surgery alone, um, but many of them are, are, are much more difficult to treat. Um, when we look at tumors, uh, we, we talk in survival in terms of uh, progression-free survival, which is the amount of time um, that a, a patient can go before there's a relapse or recurrence, um, as well as overall survival, which is the entire uh, time a patient is alive following diagnosis. Um, we look at, at the five-year progression-free survival for these tumors. It's somewhere between 23 to 45%. So um, less than half of the patients are going five years without a relapse. Um, and overall survival uh, for patients at five years is about 50 to 65%. So just a little over half of patients um, are making it past five years. So there's definitely a need for improved treatments for these tumors, um, as many are difficult to treat and cure. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, surgery uh, is the main uh, treatment that we have for these tumors. Um, patients who are diagnosed with ependymoma, uh, the first step is going to be to try to remove as much of the tumor as possible. Um, and really the location of the tumor plays a large role in the, the neurosurgeon's ability to resect the tumor. Um, so with the diagram of the brain there on the right, um, you notice those uh, sort of light blue spaces uh, in the center of the brain, those are the ventricles. Um, so tumors that sort of arise from the upper uh, portion of those uh, ventricles, the lateral ventricles, um, which are in the upper yellow part of the brain, um, those are typically easier to resect, although they can still be challenging. Um, but tumors in that location typically are a little bit easier for the, the neurosurgeon to completely resect. Um, we go down to the fourth ventricle, um, which is that tiny light blue fluid space sort of between the, the purple brain stem and the green cerebellum. There's that tiny light blue channel. Um, tumors that arise from that area can be much more difficult to resect. Um, there's a lot of important neurologic real estate in that area. Um, we have the, the brain stem, which is a critical portion of the brain. Um, if these tumors start to invade or go near the brain stem, it can be difficult for a neurosurgeon to resect those tumors. Um, we also have the cranial nerves, which come off the brain stem, which can be involved with these tumors. Um, cranial nerves are very important structures that control eye movement, facial movement, um, and a, a lot of other important functions. Um, and so if the tumor becomes intertwined with those cranial nerves, it can be difficult uh, to resect those tumors without causing neurologic injury to the child. Overall, we know that surgical resection plays an important role in the curate of these tumors. And so um, if on the first surgery, a surgeon's not able to get the entire tumor out, uh, we definitely encourage uh, second look surgeries where uh, the surgeon may have to go back in um, second, sometimes even a third time, uh, to try to remove as much of the tumor as possible. We really want to get out the entire tumor if possible up front. Next slide. And then after surgery, uh, radiation therapy tends to be the mainstay of, of treatment for ependymoma. Um, obviously in the, the pediatric population, we're dealing with young children and giving radiation can be very challenging to young children because of the effects of radiation on the developing brain. Um, Thankfully, uh, we do have some newer modalities and, and ways to give radiation, such as proton beam radiation, where we can um, really focus the radiation on the tumor bed uh, where, where the tumor was and uh, try to avoid uh, hitting the other healthy areas of the brain with radiation. Um, so that allows us to get a much tighter field around the tumor um, and spare the, the healthy brain tissues from the effects of radiation. 
Um, but even still, um, there, there are long-term effects that we get concerned about. And so, um, and young children, um, we really try to avoid and, and minimize radiation as much as possible. Although in a pandemoma, oftentimes in order to achieve cure, um, it's something that we just know that we need to do. Um, and so using proton beams can help minimize those effects. Um, there are some lower risk, more indolent growing ependymomas um, that may not require radiation therapy now that we've seen some of the data um, and may be able to be managed with surgical resection alone, but certainly any type of uh, more aggressive ependymoma would need radiation treatment. Next slide. Uh, and then as I mentioned, uh, chemotherapy is a little bit of a hot topic of debate. Um, there are some historical studies which have some conflicting data about the, the role of chemotherapy. Um, some of the older studies from uh, Children's Cancer Group and PSYOP um, have shown good response rates uh, in dependomomas uh, that were treated with chemotherapy. Um, other, uh, particularly some international studies from Europe, um, have shown really minimal benefit. Um, so we have this conflict of data where, where some studies show a benefit, others do not. And so it makes it very difficult to know what the, the proper role for chemotherapy is, especially keeping in mind the fact that a lot of these drugs have you know, some significant side effects and can affect things such as hearing. Um, so we want it, to use it in a, in a you know, really uh, thoughtful way when we do use it. Um, there are some thoughts that chemotherapy could have benefit um, in delaying radiation for very young children, sort of giving them a longer runway to have some further brain development before introducing radiation. Um, or helping to shrink down tumors and allow for uh, an easier resection by a neurosurgeon if the tumors respond to chemotherapy. Um, but this is something that we're continuing to look closely at because it's a really important question. Um, recently, there's been some data um, that shows that ependymoma is really not one disease, but rather, rather a series of different um, genetic or molecular subgroups uh, of diseases. Um, and once we're able to tease out this data based on some of the um, more recent studies that have been done through the Children's Oncology Group, um, we may be able to identify certain subgroups of ependymoma that may benefit from chemotherapy while others do not. Um, and we're still awaiting those answers and that data from these studies. And hopefully uh, in the coming years, it'll be a little bit clearer in terms of um, which ependymomas may benefit from chemotherapy compared to others. Next slide. And then I, I just mentioned the molecular subgroups. So, um, Trying to just keep this as simplified as possible. There's actually, um, you know, at least nine different subgroups of ependymoma. But when it comes to uh, pediatric patients, there's really four main subgroups. Um, this is not all encompassing, but just to keep things simplified, um, two of these subgroups uh, occur in the upper part of the brain, the supratentorium. Um, that's the rel A uh, molecular subgroup, as well as YAP1, um, and then the posterior fossa and the lower back portion of the brain. Um, we call them EPNA and EPNB. Um, and these are the, the two main subgroups that we see in the lower portion of the brain. Um, and these are these subgroups are, are divided based on uh, specific genetic uh, alterations or mutations that are seen in the tumor. Um, and we know that that each of these groups sort of has a predilection for, for certain age groups, genders, um, and also just uh, different clinical aggressiveness uh, in terms of behavior as well as um, cure rates. Um, so just to, again, to keep things simple, um, in supratentorium, the REL-A uh, tumors tend to have a worse prognosis. If you look um, over on the uh, right side, you can see that survival curve. Um, that's a, a graph of survival over time. You can see it dipping downwards um, as we go through time, uh, where the YAP1 patients really, it's a straight line. So these are, are more indolent uh, tumors that tend to not be as aggressive and have very good uh, cure rates. Um, and then in the posterior fossa, breaking down uh, between uh, EPNA and B, um, again, the, the EPNA tend to be more aggressive. You can see that downward slope of the survival curve um, where the, the EPNBs have a, a more straight line survival curve and a better prognosis. Um, and this is important information that helps us determine um, how to manage these patients, how aggressive we need to be uh, with things like radiation and other treatments. Next slide. As I mentioned, very brief overview. Um, these tumors are very complex and present a large challenge for us as neuro-oncologists. Um, again, uh, outcomes are very dependent on the ability to achieve a complete resection and, and tumor location plays a large role in that. Um, we are starting to 
do molecular classification of these tumors, helping to identify higher risk populations, um, knowing that these uh, patients may require more aggressive treatment or, or newer novel therapies. Um, in addition, we know that some of these tumors may be less aggressive and can be managed with things like surgery alone, um, and perhaps sparing patients from, from the need for radiation. Um, as we move forward with PNOC and looking at designing clinical trials, um, one of the challenges we face is, are these molecular subgroups and the fact that all ependymomas aren't the same? Um, we start to break the tumor down into various subgroups. It leaves us with smaller and smaller patient populations, uh, which can provide a challenge when we're trying to, to power studies and accrue enough patients in order to make determinations on certain outcomes. Um, and so while it's a benefit to have this increased uh, information and, and nuance about how patients may uh, and different, how different tumors may respond to treatment. It also creates some challenges with the smaller patient numbers that we have for trials as we break these patients down into smaller and smaller groups. Um, but overall, um, the, the PNOC Appendomoma Working Group, um, which we're all a part of, um, is dedicated to, to working uh, together collaboratively. We've taken uh, people from the preclinical side who are bench researchers, basic scientists, as well as uh, clinicians, like many of the people on this panel. Um, we're all putting our heads together, working together, um, on an international basis to try to uh, all be rowing in the same direction um, so that we can uh, come up with uh, newer, better, improved therapies uh, for these tumors and, and think really thoughtfully about ways that we can approach it uh, so that we can have better outcomes for our patients. So thanks, everybody. And then would you like me to just keep going straight through or, or are there any questions? Go ahead, Jamie. Questions in the Q and A. So keep going. All right. Um, well, thanks everyone for who's attending virtually on the on the webinar. It's, it's definitely a it's a pleasure to be here, even talking about a, a really tough arena. So the next step, we're going to talk a little bit about what you do when the ependymoma has come back. This is a very quick overview, but Dr. Brownstein will talk a little bit more about the radiation component, and I'll give a little bit of a feedback, uh, a little bit of an overview of the situation that we're in. So what happens when a child has an ependymoma that has been treated in some way, surgery, radiation, potentially chemotherapy or targeted therapies, and then it comes back? Uh, there's no question that whenever ependymoma or any other tumor comes back, it becomes more difficult to treat for many different kinds of reasons. Um, but the first step is going to be to try to do that same sort of rinse and repeat. You want to get it out if you can. Uh, if it's in multiple places, that clearly makes it more challenging. If it's proximate to critical structures like the brainstem, as Derek mentioned, that makes it more challenging. Um, and ultimately, you know, the the idea is, if possible, to eradicate the visible presence of the ependymoma, um, because you're also probably going to do or or think about doing radiation as well. Why these two things? It's it's just quite simply because they are the two most effective therapies that we have. And you one might naturally wonder why would you just do the same thing when you ostensibly did aggressive surgical resection and radiation up front and clearly the tumor has come back. And in part, it's to give us some time and to get that ependymoma on its back feet and its back legs so that you can potentially employ some other treatments. I wanna just highlight a couple of things that Derek mentioned. Repeat aggressive resection, those are easy things to say, but they're difficult when you're thinking about the complications that might occur to your child from one or two or multiple neurosurgery, um, neurosurgical endeavors. And it's also true that while neurosurgeons, pediatric neurosurgeons are tend to be across the board, very good at their job, there are some surgeons who can who have done more of these kinds of surgeries or who might have different perspectives. And so I think that one truth of this journey for all patients, especially if the tumor has come back, is to involve other experts and second opinions uh, in, in order to get maybe the best shared mental model of, of people who are involved in pediatric ependymoma. Um, and then with re-radiation, um, I'll leave most of that to Dr. Bronstein to kind of talk about as well. There are clearly going to be some downsides, but again, uh, you know, whether it's proton beam or photon beam, you know, it is important to find practitioners and providers who are particularly expert in, uh, in the pediatric brain, which is such a sensitive and high real estate um, arena. One of the other pieces that um, Dr. Hansen mentioned on the upfront overview is that we are learning so much more about the molecular and biological 
makeup of these tumors. And it actually changes or it has the potential to change what we think is a good treatment plan outside of the surgery and the radiation. So uh, making sure that tumors that are taken out again at this point and, and even up front, hopefully as well, have been subjected to these brand new cutting edge, super cool ways of looking really at what seems to make these epinomoma cells tick in that child. That I think is something that would be really informative for the doctors who are trying to come up with a better plan than simply surgery and radiation, especially when that, that plan has probably failed already. So after the after you've done that, so you've taken the tumor out again and you've engaged with radiation, this is the simultaneous component where you're considering what the next treatment might be. Um, and clearly the first is clinical trials because as Dr. Hansen mentioned, we don't currently have a, sort of a standard of care. This is a better treatment for tumors that have come back. And so the, the arena that you can really leverage the most cutting edge, really not the stuff that was discovered 10 or 20 years ago, but the stuff that is being discovered now, the things that are gonna move the needle and innovate and finally start to cure children in this who, who suffer recurrent epinomoma, those treatments will most likely be within the context of trials. And in addition to which, as Dr. Hansen mentioned, we are unable to really figure out how to better treat children whose tumor has come back outside of a clinical trial because it's too difficult and statistically infeasible to think about one child at a time when you're trying to learn about how you treat everybody a little bit better. So trials are super important to, to really help every child with a recurrent epinomoma. It of course doesn't mean that there's always the perfect trial out there, whether it's because it's too far away or it doesn't fit exactly the situation of a child with a recurrent epinomoma. And so there are, do remain other kinds of treatments. We have weapons in the armamentarium. We have you know, the radiation and the surgery, which we already mentioned, but there is chemotherapy. There's debate about how effective that might be, and maybe it's effective in some or not other kinds of recurrent epinomoma. There's targeted therapy and immunotherapy and different kinds of focal treatments that are being developed now. Those are sometimes able to be administered outside of the context of a clinical trial, and certainly I think should be considered, you know, just trying to think about what the best path forward is, is to put everything on the table and to kind of consider what out of the options that we have is going to be the best. Um, and, you know, it's also very true that ependymoma can be very, what we call indolent. It doesn't mean that we've necessarily cured it, but those, but those timelines that Dr. Hansen was talking about, the five-year event-free survival or overall survival, if you happen to be looking very carefully at the um, picture that he had where it had the different kinds of epinomoma, what you actually saw was that over a span of 10 years, you were having slow recurrence of epinomoma. So there's there are definitely some children who have epinomomas that will come back. And when they come back, you you suspect or you're, you assume that it's going to come back again. But that period of time may be longer rather than shorter, even on the order of years occasionally. And so careful monitoring, if there doesn't seem to be a good trial and the options that are on the table don't seem to be good fits for a particular trial, it's you know, careful monitoring and, and hoping that you get a, a you know, you get a you really knocked that epinomoma down with your really excellent surgery and radiation. Those are definitely options um, to be considered on the table as well. And sometimes there are trials that can happen before the repeat surgery. What typically happens for our children with a pneumoma that recurs that we catch it with our serial MRI scans. And so a lot of the times the child feels great and nothing else is going on from a clinical standpoint. And then we see something small or, or um, we see some growth that is, is starting to make us concerned. And in that situation, occasionally there will be a trial that makes the most sense in the context of before you do the operation. Maybe the medicine or the immunotherapy or the treatment needs, we just need to learn more about it. Or maybe it's true that that medicine or that treatment will couple best before you do the surgery or actually while you're doing the radiation. So as scary as that time frame is, when you see an MRI that starts to have movement of a tumor, the, exactly what you've been fearing for so long, you know, the first step should really also be, well, let's not just jump into surgery unless there's a real urgency there, but getting a sense of what is out there and what, you, what doors you may close or what exciting uh, treatments might be out there if you do it with or before the surgery or radiation, just to, again, to keep a, as open a mind as you can and, and really leverage the epinomoma practitioners, both the ones that are your primary doctors, but also those in the community can be really helpful.
There are a lot of challenges, though, as um, as as Derek mentioned, as and as we'll continue to talk about. It is tough when you are in a center that to find the opinion. You know, it's it's hard to find a doctor that you trust and you feel uh, you you connect well with, um, even your primary care. And it's it's even harder when it's the health of your child on board. So finding the right opinions and doing that in a time frame which is relevant to how quickly you either feel you or your doctor feels you need to move. That's something that is, is an important consideration. Sometimes there aren't trials that are available, or sometimes the selection by the, the selection criteria for those trials uh, do not allow a family to enroll their, their child on that on that particular treatment. Um, Dr. Bronson is going to talk a little bit about radiation, but the truth is, is that surgery is tough and some of the complications can be permanent or chronic. Um, and the side effects of surgery and radiation and chemotherapy and targeted therapy, all of those really layer on. And, and sometimes children have done this not once or twice, but three or four or five times where they've gone through a different kind of treatment. So really trying to think about how can we minimize those side effects and what is our flexibility to engage in an aggressive treatment, which in your heart, you know, you need, but it's, it's tough to do that when you see a child suffering at the same time. And and just kind of hearkening back to what I was mentioning, like how how long will it take? Some some ependymomas when they come back, whether it's the first time they come back or the fifth time they've come back, sometimes they can move pretty quickly, and you really just don't have time to think about everything in the way that we want to. And then in other cases, there the the the, the uh, recurrence of the tumor is relatively slow, and it might make better sense to have your child recover, get back into school, um, think very thoughtfully and get all your opinions about what the best treatment options might be at that phase. So knowing what that is, what that timeline of progression might be is important. And like the rest of medicine, we don't always know how to predict that, although we are getting better with um, what, Dr. what Dr. Hansen was mentioning with understanding more about the biology. And then there are, are other considerations. And Dr. Bronstein, if, if you wanted to take over and start talking about some of the other complications and clinical challenges that we face. Dean, can sure, we before that. Steve gets started, if that's okay? There's some questions in the chat that I think would be good for the group. Okay. Great. Um, so there are a couple in term, in regards to, I think, some of the comments you're making about the additional molecular characterization and how we utilize that to inform our treatments. Um, so one attendee asked about the impact of um, the recently described significant chromosomal aber aberrations and how we're thinking about that in light of treatment. Um, and another similar question was just how, um, if the ependymoma subsets are, are strong predictors of um, recurrence and um, I believe survival. So we'll pause there and maybe if you can just spend a little bit more time talking about how you might be thinking about those uh, molecular characterizations. Yeah, um, really, I, that's, those are both excellent questions and, and really logical. So from the perspective of what we find in a particular pneumoma, I think there are really only two major categories of how that helps us. One, it does tell us how quickly or how inexorably we think that that tumor is going to come back. Um, and that can be a diagnosis. That can be the first time you've found out that your child has an ependymoma and, and they get this analysis. And now there are features in it that we think, gosh, those molecular features are good prognostic markers. And if the tumor does come back, it is very likely to come back in the same place. And so those are the situations where Dr. Hansen was referring to, where sometimes those markers are, are positive. And we think maybe we can consider not even doing that first radiation. I just got done telling you that that was standard of care and it definitely is. These are just some of the ways that we're trying to make our treatment better, hurt less and be more effective. Um, on the other side, sometimes those markers can be tougher to hear, and those markers can say, yeah, there really are very few children who can get through just can get through and be cured with surgery and radiation alone. And in those contexts, maybe you start thinking, okay, so even though that's the first step typically, maybe I need to start thinking about other augmentation to that treatment, whether it's immunotherapy or chemotherapy or targeted therapy or, or anything else. The other place that those markers can theoretically help us is to actually serve as either targets themselves or predictors that might say, okay, this tumor has this characteristic. We happen to have a couple of medicines that we think interrupt that pathway very efficiently. And even if there hasn't been a full trial to demonstrate that that's gonna be extremely useful, 
um, it makes a lot of medical sense and scientific sense. And, and quite honestly, it's just quite logical that we should say your tumor really seems to be thriving because of these characteristics. Let's interrupt them and then see if we can prevent that tumor from growing in the way that it wants to grow. Or your tumor has this marker on its surface and there just happens to be this T cell which is looking just for that marker. And so if that situation occurs, if that match occurs, then maybe something like that kind of treatment makes more sense. You know, uh, if you didn't have that marker, then a T cell that is looking for a particular marker and your cells don't have it, then it probably doesn't make as much sense. So, so really these markers help us with prognosis and they also potentially can help us drive exactly what kind of treatment we might have. The second question I think was how good are these markers at um, predicting outcome? And I think that that's a, it's a very, it's a nuanced question. I think on a population level, when you take every kid who has had an ependymoma and they share this particular marker, then sometimes it's easy to see that there's a clear breakpoint. There's a very clear delta where a lot of these kids survive with standard therapy or a lot of kids struggle with recurrence with standard therapy. But on the basis of an individual child, it is very uncommon for us to have um, just a complete zero or a one or a black and white. What I mean by that is um, there always seem to be some kids who buck the trend either way. That might be just a few at the tail end, or that might be a substantial but minority where you harbor this marker, it's a good marker, and yet your tumor comes back despite all of that. Or you harbor this marker and it's a marker that makes us very worried, and yet you do great for years and years, and we and we never see that tumor come back. So from the perspective of a single child, it's it's a, it's not a um, it's not particularly predictive always, and but definitely as a group, it's something that we think it can really steer our thinking. Thank you. And then I think there's a couple of questions as well that could be also well answered by either Jean or Derek again. So one of the questions is, are there newer ideas in terms of management between the first treatment and relapse, such as those that might be effective at preventing a relapse rather than waiting till it recurs? And then kind of a follow-up question is about late recurrences and how common those are seen with the pendomoma. Um, and so I'll pause there and let you all take maybe those two questions. Derek, do you want to take the those questions or? Uh, sure. <clears throat> so um, you know, obviously the, the, the goal of the initial treatment is to try to, to treat and hopefully cure the tumor. Um, if there's this concept of, you know, is there something we can do between or, or after that initial treatment to try to prevent a relapse? Um, we do sometimes use things called maintenance therapies and other tumors where we'll give a lower dose of chemotherapy for a longer period of time to try to prevent relapse. Um, it's not something that we've done a lot in the pendomoma, um, but we are uh, starting to look at therapies that that may be able to be used in a similar fashion. Um, again, these are not things that are necessarily out there at the moment, but we're we're and as part of the working group, um, we're putting together a concept looking at a drug called metformin, uh, which is actually a, a diabetic uh, medication. Um, that we think can act on some of the metabolism within cancer cells. So that may be more of a maintenance type drug where patients could be on it for a longer period of time than we typically would think of, of radiation and chemotherapy. Um, so there are things that we're looking at that, that could potentially address that, trying to keep patients on a more tolerable treatment for a longer period of time uh, to try to prevent a relapse. Um, and then in terms of, of late relapse, um, I think uh, Dr. Huang uh, had uh, sort of referenced this. Um, Again, with these gen different genetic subtypes and, and uh, behaviors of these tumors, um, there are some that are very aggressive. And so we see them coming back very quickly um, after treatment is done, if there's a recurrence. But there's also these populations where um, it behaves in a more indolent fashion, where uh, you may have a surgery, surgery and radiation or other treatment. Um, and then there's a long period of time where we don't see any tumor. And it could potentially even be up to years later um, where we do see recurrence of the tumor. And so that's why um, some of the survival data that we have from trials can be difficult to interpret because we usually look at fixed intervals of time um, on these trials. You know, maybe it's you know a year or two years. You know, certainly longer term, up to five years. Um, but um, when we have these 
tumors that can be very indolent, uh, sometimes the recurrence will be outside that window that we capture with the trial. And so it's not uncommon uh, in the pendomoma to have some longer term relapses. Um, it is something we see from time to time. And that's why it's just one of those challenges that we have with studying this tumor um, and designing trials is, is to try to accommodate um, these differences in behaviors of these tumors and when they relapse and, and how they behave and how aggressive they are. And then Derek, along those same lines, there's a question about when the tumor hasn't come back, how often should families be thinking about getting their surveillance imaging and MRI scans? Like what would be, what are standard recommendations regarding that? Yeah. Um, so just speaking you know, very much in general, um, typically um, after treatment's completed, usually scans um, are performed usually about every three months or so to monitor for recurrence. And again, it may vary from um, physician to physician or site to site, but just as you know, very loose set of guidelines, usually the first year scans are being done about every three months or so. Um, first year is, is definitely the highest period of risk in terms of relapse, although as we mentioned, they can occur at any time and certainly later. Um, but usually after that first year, if everything looks good at that point, we'll start to space out the scans um, to longer intervals. So, you know, could be that in year two, scans are being done every four to six months. Um, and then beyond that, um, typically, you know, we get to the point where maybe we're scanning annually um, because the risk of recurrence is lower. So again, there, there's some, there's no hard and fast guidelines, but that's just a general timeline of, of how scans may be spaced out after therapy. Great. Thank you. All right, Dr. Bronstein, I think back to you. Absolutely. So this really, I think, dovetails on those excellent questions and what you heard from Dr. Hanson and Dr. Warren just now, and that as part of the interdisciplinary clinical team, um, we certainly experience these challenges along with our patients and their families. The challenges being that a pandemoma represents uh, a number of likely distinct biologic entities ultimately that have different behaviors. So when the pandemoma does recur, it can recur in the same place locally, as we call it, um, or it can re recur in a different place within the craniospinal axis. Um, uh, it can be first in the brain and then in the spine or a different part of the brain, or it can happen in both places. Uh, and the treatments that would be required uh, may vary based upon that presentation at recurrence. Also, there's a great question about detecting recurrences. And frankly, speaking as a clinician, it can be challenging. Um, patients who have had uh, prior radiation, prior surgery, um, there are, can be subtle changes in the way the brain appears uh, radiographically. And even with tight imaging surveillance, even with modern, very high resolution, uh, multi-parametric imaging modalities, it can still be difficult to detect uh, recurrences um, at their initial recurrent presentation. It often can require um, interval scans until the team is confident that a recurrence has happened. And at that point, the disease may be slightly more robust. The fact that these tumors have experienced upfront surgery, radiation therapy, sometimes systemic therapy, uh, may give them an opportunity uh, to, to generate some intrinsic resistance against treatment. The fact that the tumor has come and recurred through those prior treatments uh, may mean that there is, in fact, some intrinsic biologic resistant mechanism that has emerged over that time. So subjecting these tumors to the same therapy, as you heard from Dr. Wang, um, may be of a limited benefit ultimately, but these are the therapies we have at hand. The upfront therapy carries with the toxicity and additional therapy can incur additional toxicity, and that may not be linear. Um, it can be geometric or exponential um, as we surpass potential thresholds of, of uh, tolerance for um, radiation, the different sensitive uh, substructures of the brain and the spine. Uh, and that's certainly, certainly true with re-radiation as well as surgery. The next slide. So despite that, we, radiation is a excellent uh, tool um, in, in the armamentarium uh, to treat recurrences. And shown here is just a continuum of uh, different radiation procedures that we have at hand, um, going from focal and local techniques such as radio surgery um, offered on platforms, uh, such as a gamma knife, cyber knife, linear accelerators, where we're just treating a very focal small recurrence. Uh, with very high doses to help overcome whatever intrinsic radiation resistance these tumors may have. And that can be effective and associated with somewhat limited toxicity. But again, the nature of the recurrence dictates what type of treatment is required. In some cases, the recurrence can be somewhat larger and require more conventional forms of external beam radiation therapy, either with photons or protons. And there's also a more comprehensive form of radiation um, that is offered in some instances known as craniospinal radiation, 
where we're treating um, the entire contents of uh, the cranium um, and the spinal canals, as well as the fluid that bathes the brain and the spine. Um, this would be considered the compartment at risk where ependymoma, uh, both gross tumor and microscopic tumor cells may disseminate. But as you can see from that uh, radiation plan shown in the, in the bright colors, the, the yellows and greens, um, it, it's very comprehensive, and essentially we're treating all of these eloquent areas um, that, you, that you heard about. So there can be profound impacts uh, both on neurocognition, uh, hormonal uh, components, uh, fertility, um, as well as a risk of a secondary cancer years down the road, and that can be absolutely devastating. Next slide. And it's important to note, and this is some data from um, St. Jude's, but others have shown this as well, that despite using comprehensive radiation or uh, re-radiation techniques such as craniospinal radiation, you can see from these curves um, that this um, is, is not a, a definitive um, answer uh, in that sense that these patients still show a significant propensity to still progress, um, which impacts overall survival. Um, so as much as radiation is a tool and comprehensive radiation um, may be of value, um, this is not the, the answer. We need better uh, tools um, to be able to address these, these situations. Thanks, Dave. Um, so there, there was that excellent question about chromosomal abnormalities, <clears throat> and then there was another great question about, well, what do you do after you do the radiation and the surgery? Do you ever even up front start thinking about other treatments? And Dr. Hansen was spot on when there's nothing that is commonly accepted as this is the blanket right answer for everybody. But there are definitely some situations that we're starting to think that very that we really need to be potentially uh, engaging with preventative therapy besides just surgery and radiation. Um, the 1Q and 6Q, those are just funny numbers and letters up there, but those represent chromosomal abnormalities, a gain of a chromosomal component at 1Q and a loss at 6Q. And, and the reason that those are important, and this was just an example of many of the positive and negative genomic and other uh, tumor characteristics that can push you to a higher or lower risk category is that ultimately the patients whose ependymomas that are in the posterior fossa um, and in that sort of group A that we were talking about that harbor these alterations um, don't do as well as their peers who, at least by imaging and even by extensive surgical resection, still um, have very similar tumors. This, I think, Again, it bears repeating that this is a place that we're trying to get smarter about, understanding that things that we once thought were the same or can be very different. But if you focus on the graph on the right and, and what these are, these are um, progression-free survival curves. So they're curves that demonstrate how long this group of patients goes before a tumor comes back. And you can see a very clear difference when patients' ependymomas in this area have these chromosomal abnormalities. If they don't have them, then you know they have a certain progression-free survival curve. Um, that's the blue line, and it can go all the way down to if they have both of them, then it gets pretty tough, and, and we expect that that tumor is likely to come back despite um, really great surgery and, and really cutting-edge radiation. Uh, and then we have to be thinking about, well, how do we prevent that narrative from going forward like this? It is also true that the scientists that Derek mentioned and talked about as being really hand in hand with us as clinicians, um, really, it's been a tremendous, I think, in my opinion, alteration in the paradigm of how we do this. It's no longer scientists working separately and by themselves or even in groups, but by themselves. And it's no longer the clinicians seeing the patients are running the trials, but not really engaging. Now it's really a truly a team sport in a way that we've always hoped it could be, but in my opinion, is only activated and actualized in the last decade. Um, but these are just two pretty complicated figures. And really what they're here to sort of just demonstrate is that those really smart scientists learning about how the immune system works around the tumor in the left-hand uh, figure or in the right hand, how do the genes of the cells change? And this is this was in the context of the one and six Q alterations that we just talked about last slide. Well, what does it mean? What does it mean to the cell? What parts of the cell's pathways are stronger or more activated and which parts are less? And if we can really learn from those differences, then we might and should be able to then design the science to force a cell either away or towards a specific kind of pathway expression so that we can make them vulnerable if they were not vulnerable before. But ultimately, I think, it, you know, currently today, 
the proof in the pudding of where we are for a child with a pneumonia today is reflected in those trials that are open for children who have a pneumonia. Now, these are all for children whose pneumonia has come back. Um, and they range from the top, which is a radiation kind of a pneumonia directed trial to immunotherapy, which is really the last three of those, or really, I guess the last four, which um, involve immunotherapy and targeted treatments as well. And when I look at this, and I just ran this search yesterday uh, in clin trials, I think the take home message is that there's some really exciting, there are two of them. There's some really exciting um, kinds of treatments that we have never tried before. But the other takeaway is that this is a very small number of trials and only one of these is actually specifically devoted against, or two of these are specifically devoted against pediatric ependymoma. The rest are those that kind of allow ependymoma as a possible responder to their particular intervention. And that really, I think, highlights the large problem that we've got uh, an incredible amount of science now um, and yet when you translate it down to what is actually seeing the patients, that, that funnel has gotten pretty small uh, in the current day. And this, is the, and this was really just the pipeline that was important because it takes a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of people working together and quite honestly, a little bit of luck to start on the left-hand side of that where you actually discover some new interesting things about particular kinds of ependymoma that suggest that there's a way to kill it that nobody has tried before. Um, and then the trialists are talking to the biologists and the companies and the funders to try to figure out how to do that. We think about protocol development. What do we now, you know, it takes a long time to put these protocols together and to get them approved, to fine tune them so that they're really going to help us to use these treatments in children without hurting them or minimizing that risk. Um, and then eventually that clinical trial gets released. And that clinical trial released all the way on the right side, that's that tiny short group of trials that are currently available. And it's this pathway that we really want to push faster uh, and in a more effective way. So this, uh, you'll hear in a second from Dr. Wexarea about an expansion to study that he's helping to lead right now, PINACO 27. This is in the space of potential protocol development. So we have gotten past the translational discovery validation components. We are not yet at the clinical trial re release place. And this is a relatively long part of the arrow. And, um, and, and, and with any, like with everything else, the resources that we need to develop that are important. And then I thought maybe, Rob, you could start talking about what the idea is of the trial that you're helping to lead and, and how it might be pertinent to Epinomoma. Um, Absolutely. So um, I, as uh, Bruce said earlier, I'm Rob Wexler-Rea. I am not one of those smart scientists that Gene referred to, but I am a scientist at Columbia University. And um, I'm really excited to tell you about a concept for a trial that um, is underway for medulloblastoma and we're hoping to expand to ependymoma. Um, this is based on the notion that you've heard over and over again um, in this webinar that um, ependymoma is not all the same tumor. There are multiple subtypes of ependymoma and different kinds of recurrences and different molecular aberrations in each of these tumors. And so it's safe to say that if every patient's tumor is not different, there's certainly many different types of ependymoma. And one solution to this um, that's been proposed over the last decade or so is a concept called precision or personalized medicine. And this is the idea that we should be tailoring our therapies to patients' individual tumors so that we can give each patient the medicines that are going to target um, their, tumor their tumor's growth. In most cases, at least in the past, this has been done by sequencing the tumor, the DNA of the tumor, and looking for mutations and then inferring that those mutations might be good targets for therapy. The problem is that in many pediatric brain tumors, there are no mutations or there are very few mutations. And among those mutations that you discover, most of them don't have drugs that you can use. And so if you simply sequence a patient's tumor, um, you often don't end up with therapeutic recommendations that are going to help them. And this has been borne out in multiple clinical trials. So to deal with this, we have come up with an alternative approach rather than just sequencing the DNA, although sequencing the DNA is still important. Um, we have decided to test patients' tumors, tumor cells for sensitivity to multiple drugs. Using uh, an approach called high-throughput drug screening, 
we can take patients' tumor cells and expose them to several hundred or even thousands of drugs and determine which of those drugs is most potent at killing those tumor cells, at least in the lab, in a dish. Now, it's important that to note that just because a drug kills tumor cells in a dish doesn't mean that it's going to work in a patient. However, if a drug does not kill tumor cells in a dish, the odds of it working in a patient are much lower. And so this is a way of prioritizing candidate therapies that might be effective for a patient. And we started doing this when I was uh, faculty in San Diego uh, at Rady Children's Hospital. We started doing this about five years ago and um, demonstrated that it was feasible and effective to be able to uh, take patients' tumor cells and test them against hundreds of drugs. It worked so well that we decided to approach PNOC and see if we could do this on a larger scale. Um, and this resulted in the opening of a trial called PNOC 27, um, which opened uh, about a year and a half ago and um, has been accruing patients since then. Um, and essentially, Gene, if you want to put up that slide, I can sort of um, talk through the, the scheme. But the basic idea is that um, a patient will, uh, with recurrent medulloblastoma will undergo surgery. Some of their tumor tissue will be taken out and sent for DNA sequencing to see if there are any mutations that we can target. And some will be sent for this high throughput drug screening where we put uh, tumor cells in multiple wells of a dish. And then in each well of the dish, we put in a different drug. And we ask simply in which of those wells, which of those drugs most effectively kills tumor cells. And we get the data back within about two weeks from this uh, exercise. And then we convene a molecular tumor board that is a group of physicians and scientists from multiple institutions around the country and in fact, around the world. We have a Zoom call in which we discuss the data and we come up with recommendations for a combination therapy for three or four drugs that could be used to treat this patient that um, seem to be effective at killing the patient's tumor cells in a dish and therefore might be promising for killing that patient's tumor cells in the brain of that patient. And so um, this trial is open currently at five institutions. We've accrued seven patients and <clears throat> we've learned a lot from each of these patients. The story is quite different from patient to patient in terms of their um, progression, in terms of which drugs seem to be most effective, but it does seem that it's feasible to accrue this data, to get the information and then uh, use the information to make recommendations for therapy. And um, we don't know yet, there are too few patients to know whether this is effective, but certainly this seems to be an approach that can be um, used to identify therapies that can't be chosen based on any other information that we have. Now, as I said, PNOC27 has been uh, focused on recurrent medulloblastoma, but we think that this would be an ideal approach for recurrent ependymoma as well. Um, recurrent ependymoma is frequently, as you've heard, frequently lethal. These tumors often have very few or no mutations that can be targeted with uh, known therapies. Um, no therapy has been shown to be consistently effective at relapse, and Many patients at this stage undergo surgical re-resection. So there is tissue available that we could use for this purpose. So we're really excited to see whether we can create an expansion of this trial that would focus on recurrent ependymoma and open up the opportunity for this approach to inform how we treat those patients. Can I, can I just make one comment on that? Or maybe it's not, maybe it's not one comment, maybe it's more than one comment. Um, I am really excited. So one, Dr. Wexareya is one of the leading scientists in the pediatric brain tumor space. So forget what he said about not being one of those people. But the second is that one of the components of this, the whole genome sequencing and the RNA sequencing, the whole exome sequencing, those are really smart ways to look at the DNA and the RNA. But those are actually things that we have been trying to do for a little while now. The part that really I think is super exciting to me is the real per patient, their tumor cell drug testing, which I haven't seen happen very frequently. And one piece that bears mentioning that most people on the Zoom may not know is that ependymoma, because of that sort of cadence of slowness to it, that sort of slow, it's definitely gonna happen, but sometimes it can be very slow. 
that has really been an obstacle to us trying to develop those cells into laboratory models because it takes so darn long and often it fails. And that is true for both in mice and in the Petri dish. And so you can imagine that it's you can't use those cells to generate a cell line because by the time, even if you were lucky and it worked, you got that cell line, um, you'd be far past where that information might actually be helpful. So uh, like Rob said, we don't know. I don't know whether this approach is going to work, but um, to actually take the live cells out of the brain and then ship them overnight for this kind of testing, that's truly remarkable. And um, I'm excited to see sort of what happens in your Medjolo trial, uh, but hopefully also what might happen in a Pinamoma sister trial. I wonder if I could just make a, a comment um, to reinforce what Rob was saying, that that we do pick up to four drugs or multiple agents that, that seem to, to deal with multiple different kinds of pathways to try and deal with the vulnerabilities, the potential vulnerabilities of each of those complex pathways that may be altered um, that we can detect based on the screening. The other thing I think that's important to emphasize is the drugs that are being chosen are off, what we call off the shelf. These are drugs that are already approved for other indications. And so we don't have to go through it. They aren't quote experimental in that, con in that context because it would be very difficult to get four uh, industry partners to come together and, and give us four different experimental drugs. But, but these are drugs that we have a lot of information about. We know a lot about their toxicities, how to give them, the kinds of dosing to give. So it really is an ideal, I think, and I'll say the word exciting, strategy to use th these th this, this entire process to, to, to get these drugs to, to these kids. Adam, I, I wonder if you could give uh, our viewers just an overview of what it's gonna take to get this up and running. Yeah, thanks, Bruce. Absolutely. Gene, would you mind putting the slide deck back up real quick? While we're doing that, um, maybe just spend one minute. There's one question in the chat left over. I want to make sure it got um, addressed. There is a question about whether or not the panelists felt recurring tumors were most likely from leftover residual tumor cells or from um, similar cells, which perhaps were dormant um, and then became active in the recurrent setting. I can give a quick uh, speculative answer. Uh, I think that uh, we don't really know, but um, chances are that surgical uh, resection cannot get at all the cells, particularly cells that have migrated away from the primary tumor site. And so even though there might be residual cells that uh, that are dormant, um, the odds of surgery and even radiation hitting every last cell is low. So I think we have to come up with therapies that are not only spatially directed like surgery and radiation, but also chemically directed at the vulnerabilities of the tumor cells and that can get at um, places where the tumor is not visible, but the cells are still there. I would agree. But the question is not really an either or. I think that it's quite possible that they're both true. Now, when we talk about dormant cells, we are often thinking about stem-like cells or cells that aren't dividing rapidly and so aren't quite as vulnerable to chemotherapy treatment, for instance. That's not quite as hinge-pointed on a pneumoma because chemotherapy is a less common treatment that we use for this particular group of patients. And so um, I do think that it's it's still possible that there's a more baby-like kind of a pneumoma cell that's a little bit more resistant to systemic therapy. Um, I would anticipate that it would still be surgically removable, except what Dr. Wexareo was saying is spot on, which is it's very difficult. You know, if these tumors were on the skin, then it's quite easy to take a wide swath of normal tissue around it and be pretty certain you've gotten not only the visible tumor, but any cells that had started to move outside of that tumor space. But that's clearly not doable in the brain because that real estate is way too expensive to, to consider doing a wide surgical resection margin. Um, and so... I do also know that sometimes these cells change, and I think that that's because of the things that we do potentially, or it may also be because there are cancer cells and cancer cells mutate uh, or they change the way that they act otherwise. 
and they can acquire certain mutations and alterations. So tumors and epinomomas, for instance, just to use the example that I was talking about before, that one Q and 6Q. Um, tumors that don't harbor those alterations to begin with can sometimes acquire them. And uh, mm -hmm. some groups have, have published and, and discussed how um, a tumor that becomes more aggressive may have acquired particular mutations that they didn't used to have. Um, and so, you know, really, I think that all the truth is, is that as Dr. Dr. Wexler says, we're not sure exactly what the, the linchpin of the recurrence is necessarily. Um, it's probably involving multiple elements of the question, though. Thanks, Gene. All right, back to you, Adam. Yeah, fantastic. All right, if you want to go to the next slide, I should be good. And I should say thank you, Rob, as well. He led into that question for Gene. <laughs> Um, so everyone has heard from the, you know, the scientific dream team that's going to make this, this project and this trial happen, but our role at the foundation is to make sure they have the resources to get it done. Um, and as everyone knows, precision medicine isn't cheap. We're looking at uh, a minimum goal of trying to raise $150,000, uh, over the fourth quarter of this year. So over the next couple of months, and that would allow 10 patients to be enrolled in this feasibility study to see, um, to see where we can get with this. So, um, that's only the beginning. You know, certainly we would we would love if budget would allow to enroll more patients. Um, and if this moves towards the clinical trial phase of the flow chart we saw earlier, we would need to raise much, much more. But for a start, um, $150,000 is our goal. Um, and we can certainly use your help. So uh, Noah's Legacy Foundation, they've already pledged a year in gift to this project. We're so thankful for them. Um, I'm excited to have conversations with many of our foundation partners um, and see if uh, they're willing to help. Um, but uh, if you want to go to the next slide, um, there are ways that anybody on the call can help. So um, any donation uh, that you would like to restrict to this project specifically for any amount can be done through our website and we'll, you'll get a follow up email as well. But create a fundraiser, talk to your friends and family, help spread the word about PNOC. All of those things are so important. My email address is there on the screen. Um, and, and like I said, if you want to support the Appendum Working Group specifically, 100% of your donations can be restricted to make sure your funds are going towards this project. So please reach out. Um, would love to have a conversation with anybody who just wants to learn more about how they can help. But we're going to work really hard to raise this money over the next couple of months. So uh, in Q1 of next year, they can be ready to go. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Cassie, I know that puts us just at about time. Um, so are there any more questions that have come up in the Q&A? No, I think we've answered all of them. I'm hopeful at least. Everyone we have is resolved and answered. Fantastic. So I want to take the opportunity then to thank our panelists. You know, what an incredible group. Um, and what an amazing amount of knowledge that was shared in, in the last 60 minutes. You know, having been in this space as the uh, parent of a, a pandemoma survivor, actually, um, I can truly say that, you know, I, I can really see the impact that the collaboration is having um, and the momentum that's being created both scientifically and clinically after such a long period where there wasn't a lot of momentum. I think it's an incredibly exciting time for pediatric brain cancer. And obviously the answers can't come fast enough, but I think that you know, it's, it's very tangible to feel the progress that's being made by this group and others. I want to thank our collaborating foundations, Noah's Legacy, uh, Tommy Strong, the RCD Foundation and, and CERN for supporting the work of PNOC, uh, sharing this webinar with your communities. And they're all great groups to make philanthropic gifts to as well as they continue to support PNOC's work in this area. And obviously it's only by coming together and collaborating like this that we're going to change the landscape of this disease for patients and their families. So thank you for everybody who participated today. Thank you for everybody who uh, who joined. Uh, we hope you found uh, value in today's webinar. And please feel free to reach out to us if there's anything we can do to help. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.